Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled round your waist, with the breastplate of your righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Amen. It's a very well-known passage, uh, but it is a very deep passage the more i've kind of looked at it the the more the more there is in it it's it's an amazing passage so i'll read that to you matthew chapter 4 verses 1 to 11 if perhaps you join me in a prayer asking god to help us to understand what he has to say to us today Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it is able to instruct us, it's able to comfort us, it's able to challenge us, able to rebuke us. And Lord, we do bring ourselves to you now, Heavenly Father, and pray that you would speak to us. Pray that you give me clarity in the words I say. We pray that you would give all of us hearts that hear what you have to say to us as individuals. We pray for Jesus' glory and in his name. Amen. So Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God... Tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. This is such a dramatic passage that 
it strikes me that it reads a bit like a film script. You've got evil, the king of evil, the devil, seeking to triumph, but being defeated by the king of love, the Lord Jesus Christ. The first scene is in the wilderness, which is a parched desert. It moves to the precarious heights of the top of the temple in Jerusalem. And then ends up on a mountaintop with a kind of enormous panorama before Jesus. It reads like a film script, except it's not a film. It's reality. It actually happened. Satan at his most evil battles with Christ, the Holy Son of God. I don't know what surprises you see in this passage, but um, there are things that st struck me. There's the audacity of the devil to think that he can tempt, to think that he can try and make the Son of God fall. The audacity of it. And to, to say to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, do this. Questions also that come to my mind, they may come to yours. Why was Jesus willing to be subjected to this? He didn't have to be. Also, why was the Holy Spirit complicit in this temptation? We're told there in verse one that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Isn't that strange? Why, why, would, why would that be? Well, I hope as we uh, look today at this passage, we'll see maybe some of the answers to that. But we're going to look in, uh, in, in some detail at the three temptations, and then we will finish off seeing what we can learn about our Lord Jesus Christ from these. So the three temptations that Satan presents to Jesus are this. Turn stones into bread, and that was to combat his hunger. Jump off the temple roof. And that was to show everyone through this miraculous deliverance that would happen that he is the son of God. And the last one, most awful of all, bow down and worship the devil. So that he would receive, so that Jesus would receive the world and its glory. With each temptation... And they, they, have, they all have this similarity. The devil told Jesus to put himself first rather than be obedient to his father. And it's true that when the devil tempts, as he tempted Jesus and as he tempts us, he wants to destroy us and he wants to bring us down. But his main purpose is not that. His main purpose is to fight against God. And he is trying to bring us to fall and to sin against God. So Jesus combats each temptation by quoting the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, strange. Why is that? What's the connection between the temptations and Deuteronomy? Well, we see here that there's a parallel in the temptations that Jesus was facing to what the Israelites faced in their journey through the wilderness. The Israelites, you may remember, spent 40 years when they left Egypt going through the wilderness. And they fell into various sins along the way. Jesus now parallels their experience by spending 40 days remember the 40 is the obviously the similarity there 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by the devil but rather than falling to temptation he's victorious over it so how are jesus's temptations similar to the israelites and how are they similar to our temptations today? So as we look at each one, I'd like us to see uh, what it was to do with the Israelites and what it is to do with us today. 
So temptation number one, turn stones into bread. As we um, saw, this, this temptation was to combat hunger. He'd spent 40 days without food, so he was very hungry. And also, although the passage doesn't tell us this, we know from a common sense that he was also very weak and very vulnerable at this point. The devil tempts him very simply, look after yourself, feed yourself. Jesus answers with the words of Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. And as I say these verses, you can look them up, but perhaps just listen, because um, I will read them to you. And when there's a bigger passage, we'll, we'll look at those together. So Deuteron Deuteronomy 8, verse 3 says, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So what was the Israelites' experience? Well, Numbers chapter 11, verse four to nine, it recounts the story of the Israelites complaining that they had no food. They had left Egypt where they were slaves, but at least they had food to eat. And now they're in the wilderness, they've got no food. They complain to Moses, but they're also complaining against God. Why was this a sin? Not just because they were opening their mouths and complaining, but it showed a lack of trust in their God. They were in hard times and now they weren't prepared to trust him. How are we tempted like this? Well, it can be similar. It can come in many forms, but at, at the root of it, it's the same as the temptation that the devil gave to Jesus. And it's look after yourself. Your needs take priority over hearing God or following God. And as I say, that takes many forms, but um, it is a very real temptation that we all face from time to time. Jesus addressed this in Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. If you have a Bible, turn to it. I hope we will have it up here on the screen. Matthew 6, and the verses actually are 30. 1 to 33 that we'll read together but the, the the whole passage starts a little earlier verse 25 so verse 31 so do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So Jesus is saying, seek first the Father's will. It says these words, his kingdom and his righteousness. Jesus is not saying that bread, clothes, um, these things are not important. But what he's saying is seeking God is more important. What are our priorities Jesus tells the devil in our passage that hunger doesn't drive him, but obeying God's word does. Therefore, he will not turn these stones into bread. So for ourselves, is seeking God the main mission of our life? Whether you're a Christian, whether you're not a Christian, that should be our priority. First of all, above everything else, to seek God. Some people choose to fast, as Jesus did, um, so that they can um, have more time to pursue seeking God. It's not mandatory, uh, but it is a way that you can spend time seeking God. But my question to you is, is that the major mission of your life, seeking God? Jeremiah spoke the word of God to the Israelites when they were not following him. And he said this in Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. 
you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. The Lord God asks us, tells us that we must seek him with all of our heart, our main mission. So temptation two, this is a strange one. Jump off the temple roof. Now, the commentators kind of say that it was probably on a certain tower on the temple and that was looking down over the Kidron Valley. So if Jesus was on that point, it would have been a long drop down. But it wasn't going to be a problem because the scriptures say that um, he will be borne up by the angels. But the devil's temptation here is show who you are. If you are the son of God, show who you are by jumping off this roof. Jesus answers with the words of Deuteronomy 6 verse 16. Do not put the Lord God, the Lord your God to the test. So what was the Israelites experience? Well, we find this in Exodus 17 verses 1 to 7. And now they are quarreling with Moses, not over lack of food, but over lack of water. And again, they're not trusting God. And here, Exodus um, 17 verse 7 says, they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? So now they're not just saying, doesn't the Lord care for us? Now they're saying, is the Lord not among us? Is, is, is the Lord really with us? And Jesus, in our passage in Matthew, refuses to test God in this way. Prove that God is with you. Prove you are the son of God. No, says Jesus, I will not test the Lord God. So how are we tempted like this? There are times when we're tempted to think that God, you know, to ask the question, will God really look out for me? Can he be taken at his word? And in that way, uh, test the Lord. Christ, Christ concentrates, as we're seeing here, on using the word of God to answer the devil's temptations. And we see here that paramount is, is the word of God because it tells us how to follow the Lord. It is, is, is God's word to us. So when God says to us certain things, the devil would have us disbelieve those things or doubt those things. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only Christian that sometimes doubts things and sometimes have, you know, even very basic doubts come into my mind. Perhaps that's your experience, too. Matthew 28, verse 20, Jesus talking his, to his disciples before he went to heaven, back to heaven. He said, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Do you sometimes wonder whether this Christianity stuff is real? Is God really with me? Am I making it up? The devil can put all kinds of thoughts into our mind. On those times, we have to depend on the word of God. If Jesus says, I am with you to the very end of the age, we know that that is true. And in our darkest times, we need to hang on to that. 1 John 1 verse 9 is a precious verse, which we learned as our memory verse uh, um, a month or, or so ago. If we, 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Christian, do you sometimes wonder, will God really forgive that one? Will God really forgive me again for messing up, for doing that same thing? The word of God says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just 
and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So perhaps if you're not a Christian here in the building or online, that is a word for you this morning. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He is God. He will do the right thing. He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Why is it the right thing for him to be faithful and just? Because that's his character. How can he forgive our sins, vile as they are, repeated as they are? Because Christ died in our place, bearing our sin. So Matthew 6, verse 33, uh, which tells us to seek his kingdom first. We sometimes think, will I really have all I need if I follow God in this way? Is it going to be all right? Believe the scriptures, believe what God himself says. Seek first his kingdom and all these things will be added to you. So the temptation to test or doubt God's promises can come in all sorts of ways about all sorts of things. And it's not surprising because this is the devil's hallmark. Back in Genesis chapter three, verse one, you remember what devil, the devil said to Eve, did God really say? And all these thousands of years later, the devil tempts us and says, did God really say, is that really true? And to, uh, and what he said to Jesus here is amazing. He says, if you are the son of God. So he was casting doubts on whether Jesus was the son of God. And if you have your Bibles open, turn back to the end of chapter three. Um, and we looked at this last week, the baptism of Jesus and after the baptism, the spirit of God came down and rested on Jesus and a voice from heaven said, so it's the father saying, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. And the devil has the audacity to say, if you are the son of God. Then do this. The devil has the audacity to say, did God really say? Is this really true? Well, we see that he is the father of lies, the devil. Uh, that's his, his main thing. That's his hallmark. And we're not to believe his lies. So finishing this one, how can we fight doubt? I'd suggest to you that there are two things here. First of all, if we're going to fight doubt, fight the devil's temptations, we need to be grounded in the word of God. It's an obvious thing. It's a thing we say from uh, very often from from uh, the platform here. We need to know the word of God. We need to be grounded in the word of God. And then we can use those scriptures to bring our mind to the right place. The truth of scripture. And of course, the second thing is we need to believe it. Don't believe the devil's lies. Believe what the God, the truth, says in his word. So the last temptation is this. Bow down and worship me, the devil says to him. Then you will receive the world and its glory. So here, the temptation was for Jesus was to make a name for himself. Have the world's adulation, have the world's um glory jesus answers him by quoting deuteronomy 6 13 and it's not actually an exact quote word for word but what jesus is doing is giving the that the meaning of it he's, he's giving the meaning of those words deuteronomy 6 13 and jesus says to him to the devil worship the lord your god and serve him only so the Israelites experience here was found in Exodus 32 verses one to six. And this is where they're waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain. Um, he was, God was giving him the 10 commandments, but Moses was taking an awful long time. God had a lot to say to him. 
and the Mo and the Israelites were getting a bit frustrated. They were getting a bit anxious, and they took things into their own hands, and they made a golden calf. You may remember, and worshipped that calf instead of God. So this is the Israelites' experience, and it's. It can be our experience as well. But before we look at that, let me just take a little aside and give you a question. Was it in the devil's power to give Jesus the kingdoms of the world? Think about that. No, it wasn't in his power. And we look at some verses which show us why. But John 8, 44 here the devil is proving himself john 8 44 says he was a murderer from the beginning not holding to the truth for there is no truth in him when he lies he speaks in his native language for he is a liar and the father of lies so here the devil is giving a lie i i control i have the kingdoms of the world and i can give it to you now, Ephesians 2.2 2 might be the thing which um, makes us think about this a little bit more, where the devil is described as the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So the devil is ruling over people that will let him rule them. But it doesn't mean that he has ultimate control over this world. He doesn't have ownership. It's not his to give. That authority belongs only to the father. And after the ascension of Jesus, it then belonged to the son. Philippians 2 verses 9 to 11 say this, therefore, um, God exalted him as Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Every tongue should acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. Our Lord Jesus, the very one who was being tempted, is the Lord over all. Colossians 1 16, and we'll we'll you can turn to this one and read it because it's it's um it's quite important in what we're looking at here. Colossians 1 verse 16. You see it there on the screen. For in him all things were created. It's talking about Jesus again. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So who do the kingdoms of this world belong to? They belong to our Lord Jesus Christ. The audacity of the devil to ask the son of God, the creator, the ruler, to bow down and worship him. Jesus, Jesus at this point dismisses the devil um, and says, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So how are we tempted like this? Well, this might seem a bit um, off the scale for what we are tempted with. We may not be tempted to worship the devil. But we're often tempted to put other things ahead of God, whether it be possessions, people, desires. These things are sometimes more important to us than God himself. We might draw the line at saying that we worship these things or these people. But if we're putting them ahead of God, if they are number one, then we are treating them like God. So what is the most important to you? What's the driver of your life? 
For our Lord Jesus Christ, it was to follow his father and do his will. And that should be our passion and our driving as well. So let's just draw to a close now and finish off by looking at what this teaches us about Jesus. You see how Jesus was paralleling the uh, Israelites' experience in the desert, where he shows that the Israel of that time were failures, basically, because they sinned and they didn't follow God. Jesus is the true Israel. He's the one who shows us how to live. He's the one that lives right. He's the one who lives for God's glory and he is victorious where the Israelites had failed. He's a perfect example for us. So he's the true Israel. He's the son of God. Now we saw there, didn't we, at the end of chapter three, that God declared that at his baptism. And God also declared that he was pleased with his son. The devil tried to question this, but Jesus showed that he was completely in control and victorious. Even though he was in human form, suffering as we would suffer, being hungry, being tired, being weary, he was victorious. He proved he was the son of God by having this victory and staying true to his father. So we also learn then that he was obedient to his father. So verse one that we looked at at the beginning, um, Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Why did the spirit do that? Why was Jesus willing to be tempted by the devil? Because this was God's will and part of God's plan for Jesus. So Christ the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit work together to bring about the Father's will. And that's why he subjected himself to that and why the Holy Spirit subjected him to it or took him to the place where he'd be subjected to it so that he may be obedient to the Father and do the Father's will. But it also tells us, uh, finally, that because Jesus has been through this, been through our human condition, been through temptations as we do, he is able to help us. But more than that, he is able to sympathize or even empathize with us. You know, the difference between sympathizing and empathizing if you, if you feel that somebody is in an unfortunate situation, you might feel sorry for them and you will, um, uh, yeah, you'd, you'd feel sorry for them. But if you empathize, emp I can't even say it now, empathize, your very inner being, your heart goes out to them. It's a much deeper thing. You are, you are with them in it. So Jesus empathizes with us when we are tempted. Hebrews 2 verse 18 says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Um, and if you have a Bible, turn to this one, Hebrews 4 verses 15 and 16. And it's up there on the screen as well. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize, or your version might say sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Because Jesus lived a human life, he understands our weaknesses. Because he suffered temptation, he's able to empathize with us. And because he's now risen at the right hand of his father, ruling in heaven, he, we can come to him and his father and find grace to help us in our time of need. 
So what to do when we're tempted? Remember the scriptures. Remember that they are the truth. Hold on to those and ask God, your father, for help to overcome temptation. Thank you, Jeff. I'm going to hand over to you. Perhaps I'll just pray, actually, if I may, and then I'll hand over to you for the last hymn. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that he came to this earth. He was tempted. He lived a life. He went to the cross. He defeated the devil. And in taking our sins on himself, he bore your punishment for our sins so we could be free. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. We know that truth, Lord, yet we still struggle with temptation. We st still struggle with sin. And we, we acknowledge, Lord, that all temptation is basically putting ourselves forward and putting ourselves before you. Lord, that's a terrible thing to do. Help us then to remember your word, to remember your truth, to remember that you are there to help us in our time of need. And Father, uh, go with us and strengthen us as you strengthened your son. In Jesus' name, amen.